Let's go to our preaching time. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews 11, and I'm going to begin with the first two verses and go on from there. Hebrews 11, and starting with the very first verse, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. I jump all the way down to verse 33. Who, through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, and a great clause in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. We'll stop right there. Today we're going to take up part three in a sermon I've called The Benefits of Suffering. How should a true, born-again, Bible-believing saint of God view suffering, hardship? What good can come from those things? No, it's not our job to know why we have to endure hardship. Our job is to be faithful to God, despite the hardship. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own way before him. Job 13, verse 15. I'm going to still live right no matter what God throws at me. Talk about a resolution that every should, everyone should be able to make. But I've listed nine possible benefits that can come from suffering. And I'll review the entire list before we conclude today. But there are still more. This text today, Hebrews 11, describes the faith of Old Testament saints, Jews before the coming of Christ. Verse 33 says, who stopped the mouths of lions. Remember Daniel, Daniel chapter 6 in the lion's den. Verse 34, quenched the violence of fire. Think of the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace, Daniel 3. Women received their dead raised to life again, verse 35. We mentioned the widow and her son back in 1 Kings 17 last week. Verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder. To put something asunder means to rip it into two pieces and separate it. And to be sawn asunder is usually described this way. They would tie up a victim and then they would put their body into a hollow tree log, and then they would cut the log in half. Talk about a sadistic way of torturing somebody and murdering somebody. And yet the Bible says that happened to people who believed in the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, despite the hostility of the world around them. Verses 39 and 40 tell us, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You have received more from God, something from God, if you know Jesus Christ, that the, the most faithful Jew in Old Testament times never did receive. You receive the forgiveness of your sins and the removing of your sins from your permanent record. 
The Bible says, ask for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin, Hebrews 10, verse 4. And yet John the Baptist pointed to the Lord Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. Think of a police file that's been purged of every charge against you. Nothing in there any longer that could accuse you of wrongdoing. That's what God does for your soul when you trust Jesus Christ. Uh, but not only that, the, the, the sacrifice that you claim, the death of Christ on Calvary, was sufficient to cover all of your sins, past, present, and future. It doesn't need to be repeated. If it needed to be repeated, as some people profess, then it was no more powerful, no more efficacious than the death of the animals before it. But it was sufficient to do the job completely and only once. Besides those things, you have the promise of eternal, resurrected, glorified life without works, without having to earn it. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus 3, 5. It's the Holy Spirit that washes and regenerates and renews the sinner who calls upon God. Thank the Lord for that. But um, in, the old, in, in the Old Testament, in the laws of Moses and the commandments, a man's righteousness or his standing was, with God was measured, it was uh, defined, it was identified by his degree of obedience to the commandments of God and the laws of Moses. If he did those things, he was considered a righteous man, a just man, a good man, and so forth. If he did not do those things uh, sufficiently, then he was labeled an unjust man, an unrighteous man, a wicked man, a fool. But even his goodness, his righteousness and obedience could only get him as far as a place of comfort. We call it Abraham's bosom, based on the story of Lazarus and the rich man, Luke 16. Abraham's bosom wasn't the name of that place. It was a place of comfort. But when it says uh, the rich man died and saw Abraham off in the distance and Lazarus in his bosom, it simply meant Abraham had his arm around the, the Lazarus, holding him close to his bosom, comforting him at that time. And from that, we've derived the name Abraham, uh, Abraham's bosom. But that wasn't actually the name of the place. That was the uh, blessing of the place that you'd be comforted by Abraham. There's a strange heresy and a false doctrine being taught these days by Calvary Chapel pastors that people in the Old Testament were saved looking forward to the death of Jesus Christ in anticipation of his coming, death, burial, and resurrection. They were sort of saved on credit, believing in it ahead of time. That's the biggest pile of crap you'll ever hear. And I don't apologize for talking that way. I'm not slick like Joel Osteen, just smiling Joel, you know, the same sales pitch every week. But the death of Christ couldn't benefit anybody before the fact, before it happened. Everyone's saved by looking back at the death of Jesus Christ and believing in it, because now it has taken place. It's been carried out for the sake of the sinner. But you couldn't get saved on credit looking forward to it, that's what the Book of Mormon teaches. You go to the Book of Mormon, the Book of uh, Mosiah, the Book of First Nephi, the Book of Jacob, and all these other books that they've put in their supposed Old, Old Testament section, and they all talk about the coming of Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection, which would save sinners uh, centuries before it supposedly happened. Of course, it's all a work of fiction anyway, but so is the doctrine being taught by the Calvary Chapel pastors. It's a work of fiction. Find me one person in the Old Testament that was looking forward to the coming and the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and was saved on that basis. One of the great principles in the Word of God is this, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That is, if someone makes a, proposes some idea from the Scripture, they need at least two or better yet, three clear texts from the Bible to confirm that. If so, then you can call it a Bible doctrine. And that uh, reminder of two or three witnesses is given at least eight times throughout the Bible. So it's an ironclad 
rule God expects. I'd like to call one of these Calvary Chapel ministers on the radio show and say, you've talked about people in the Old Testament looking forward to the death of Christ and, and that's how they were saved. Can you give me three scriptures from the Old Testament teaching that? I challenge them to find one. But people in the Old Testament were expected to stay faithful to God in an incomplete system despite the sufferings that may occur. But what about today? Let me ask you a question. If you and I have received more from God, shouldn't our lives be easier than theirs were? The answer, of course, is no. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. Uh, if so many of them suffered unimaginable torture and warfare and bloodshed and starvation and torment uh, without forsaking God, then so should you. So should you be willing to. And we've listed nine possible benefits that can come from suffering. And of course, I mean for the Christian who faces suffering without complaining, without getting angry at God, for the Christian who faces it and accepts it and trusts God to get him through it, what possible benefits can come from it? Well, if you're keeping a, a running list, we're on point number 10 now. The benefit, possible benefit number 10 is this. It reveals the body of Christ. And let me see if I can explain that. The Bible says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13, verse 35. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6.10 Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Romans 12.15 admonishes us. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 25 to 27. Your time of hardship, your time of heartbreak, tragedy, disease, sickness, hunger, some form of pain, some form of medical uh, tragedy, some form of suffering, shows who your true friends are when those times come. For the believer, it gives a chance for the real body of Jesus Christ to manifest itself, to show itself. It's been said a true friend walks in when the rest of the world walks out. And uh, make this personal just for a moment. When I was diagnosed with cancer almost two years ago, I learned who my true friends are. They're the brethren, the fellow believers. There's a group of people that were, I thought were my friends. I'd known them for 40 years since high school. I know it's hard to believe because I'm only 36 years old. I'd known them for 40 years, but they were a handful of people who still lived in this area. And uh, they all professed to be Christians of some kind or another. And I called, or I I think I called or texted one lady and told her about my recent medical news. And I figured she would relay the message to everybody else in that group, and she did. But in two years, neither she nor any of them have called to say, Hey, Mike, I heard bad news. What's going on? Tell me about it. Not a one. And yet, I have brethren that I went to Bible school with, 
Um, some I haven't seen in 26 years since I graduated there. Tennessee, North Carolina, who call me up and say, hey, Brother Shrive, we're praying for you. My wife and I are praying for you. I'll call the bookstore in Pensacola to get some information about something. I say, hi, Brother Shrive, listen, you're still on our church prayer list. You find out who your true friends are when you go through times of suffering. And for the Christian, that's the brethren, that's the body of Christ. The first day I went to get chemotherapy, nearly a year and a half ago, that very same day I got a couple of texts from some of you kids here. I still have the text, I haven't deleted them yet. Um, telling me you're praying for me, and I, I greatly appreciate it more than that I can express to you. I want to say thank you for all of that, but I can now say from personal experience that suffering reveals the body of Christ. Point number 11, another possible benefit, is this. It gives us each a ministry. It gives us each a ministry. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's begin there with verse 3. Paul writes, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is is for your consolation and salvation. If you see us enduring pain and trial and scourgings and imprisonment and sufferings of different kinds without quitting, that's an example for you to follow. Or if you see that we find our comfort and our hope is still in God despite those things, that's an example for you to follow. Years ago, I was probably 26, 27, 28 years old, my father took me to meet a couple over in Montclair, Chuck and Betty Oler. And I don't think I'll ever forget these folks. This lady, Betty, was paralyzed from the neck down. Excuse me. She was in a bed. I think maybe she could move her arm, but that was about it. Her husband, Chuck, had to wait on her, do everything for her. You know, food, bathroom, dressing, all of those things, washing. And when he, when she needed to go to a doctor's appointment, he had one of those contraptions that lifts her up and swings her over into a reclining wheelchair that was made for her body. And he was in a wheelchair, rolling around the apartment, taking care of her, waiting on her, and there was no chance of them leaving the house to come to church and become a regular part of our meetings. But they had the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ and a smile on their face. They weren't angry with God. They weren't complaining against God. They weren't upset and saying, I'm being mistreated by God. They had the joy of Jesus Christ on them. And I thought, man, I think my dad wanted me to see that. I think he wanted me to meet them. And I, I pray that I'll never forget about that experience because it, it really made an impression on me that I don't want to forget that people can go through difficulties and trials and still hang on to the joy of Jesus Christ. And, um, and by doing that, they minister to other people. When, how many remember, how many remember uh, Sister Dora? I mean, she used to come with her, she had white hair, Dora Hendricks, and her son Ron, her grandson rather, Ron, would bring her to church. He's the guy that rode the big Harley, the motorcycle. He didn't bring grandma on the motorcycle, but, <laughs> but he would ride that on occasion. 
And I think she was, I want to say she was 95 or 96. Still had a sharp mind, able to live in her own house, but she had to get around her own house with a walker. But she could still cook for herself. And like I say, she had a sharp mind and she could talk and converse. Fortunately, she lived across the street from uh, the high school and her grandchildren could come during lunchtime and check on her every day. And her family checked on her three or four times every day. But I went to visit her in her home. And she said, you know, I don't know why God keeps me around feeble like this. I don't want to be a burden to my grandkids. I don't want to be a burden to my family. Why do you think God lets people like me live so long? And I said, well, Dora, people much smarter than us have wrestled with that question for many, many years. And the first answer that comes to my mind is this. Think about what it's doing for them. By them coming to check on you, they're learning to have compassion. They're learning to care. They're learning to love someone else more than they love themselves. They're learning to put the needs of someone else before their own needs. You know, a child doesn't learn how to show some love and compassion unless they have a pet to care for, unless they have some chores to do and, and take care of the animal, feed the dog, clean up after the dog and the cat, or whatever the case may be. You learn how to love another living being by having to take care of it and learn to love uh, a person by waiting on them and ministering to their needs. It develops something in them. It shapes their character, which will be a benefit uh, in years to come. And she said, well, I guess that's as good an answer as any. Three weeks later, she was gone. And um, that was about the only answer I could give her, but I, I think it was a good answer at the time. And um, Charles Colson spent two years in prison because of his involvement in the Watergate scandal in the 1970s. But after that, he founded Prison Fellowship, which ministers to people incarcerated, people in jail and prison, who the rest of society has forgotten about. And the rest of society would just as soon not have anything to do with. There are some great Christians behind bars. You know that? There are some great Christians in prisons in this country. They love the Lord Jesus Christ. They love the Word of God. I Sure, they're limited in mobility and they, they can't get out, can't do a lot of things. But there are some great believers uh, in prisons, men and women's prisons in this country. And so Charles Colson saw there's a need there. Because he had been through it himself. He had spent time in a federal prison. Now he knew the, the kind of lives men in those conditions go through and try to minister to them. Think of all the support groups that get started uh, to help uh, you know, sexual abuse victims or rape victims, uh, someone whose child has uh, committed suicide, someone uh, who was, whose loved one was murdered, all of those other kinds of groups. Think of people who, who start a group to help minister to someone else because they've gone through the same thing. And if you endure suffering, if you face it patiently as a believer ought to do, God can give you a ministry. So suffering can give each of us a ministry of some sort. Point number 12, benefit, possible benefit number 12 is this. You're forced to trust God more than yourself. You're forced to trust God more than yourself. The Apostle Paul wrote, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 You're limited in what you can do. You're limited in how you can change the circumstances of your life. That, that physical pain you live with, that medical problem you have, that mobility issue you have, that constant 
headache or migraines that a lot of people suffer from, you're limited in what you can do about them. And there's only so much you can do. You have to trust God eventually. You have to trust God eventually. A Christian doctor told a family, we've done all that medical science can do for your dad. He's going to have to be in God's hands now. Family members responded, oh no, has it come to that? God should be the first person you consult when you have a problem. Don't get on the phone and tell your friends about it. Don't get on Facebook and update everybody. Talk to God about it. But D.L. Moody was saved when he was 18 years old. And he became a very aggressive servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. A soul winner. And he was evangelistic from the get-go. He built a large Sunday school. Over 1,500 boys and girls coming from all over Chicago to church every week. He was being invited to preach around the country three and four days a week. He had a thriving church. He helped build a large YMCA, which stood for Young Men's Christian Association. Who knows that anymore? And in those days, the YMCA was more like a rescue mission for people desperate and needing help. So he built a large a YMCA. And God was blessing his church. And then a fire broke out in Chicago and spread very rapidly. And it, before it burned out, it was put out. It had burned up four, over four square miles of the city of Chicago. And uh, 1,000 people dead. They say 18,000 buildings and different structures were destroyed including the YMCA and Moody's Church and Moody's own home. None of those buildings were insured, so he didn't have any claims that he could make to, to recoup some money to rebuild. He was too proud to go out and beg for donations to get started again. In the midst of all that anguish, he was down and desperate and um, filled with despair. <laughs> He wrote these words. God seemed to just be showing me myself. I found I was ambitious. I was not preaching for Christ. I was preaching for ambition. I found everything in my heart that ought not be there. For four months, the wrestling went on within me. I was a miserable man. He had to learn once again the words of the Apostle Paul. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. The, uh, John the Baptist said about Jesus Christ, John 3, verse 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. Suffering forces you to trust God more than you can trust yourself. Point number 13, uh, suffering, and by that we mean suffering patiently as a believer. Suffering can make you more evangelistic. At least it ought to. Suffering should make you more evangelistic, more concerned about the souls of others. When you endure some affliction some sickness, some tragedy, some family problem, some grief, some terrible loss that is overwhelming, bearing down on you. When you come through that desperate event, when you can go through that, those devastating circumstances and trials, you're suddenly more aware of the, the needs of other people to be saved. You have a car accident. Once, it, once it's over, get out of the car. The first question ought to be, is everyone okay? Is anybody hurt? Tragedies like that make us more mindful of the needs of other people. At least they should. They certainly should for the believer make us more mindful of other people's needs. And what greater need is there than to be born again and regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God? What greater need is there than to be saved? 
You can have all the comforts of life and die without Jesus Christ. You'll go straight to hell. I want you to go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to move along here. Philippians 1, and let's begin there at verse 12. That I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me, Paul's writing this from inside of Roman jail, have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Then look at uh, how he concludes chapter 4, verses 21 and 22. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you, and the saints salute you, chiefly or especially they that are of Caesar's household. In the midst of his persecution, and uh, for all we know, another scourging, in the midst of his imprisonment, he's still preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, even to the, the guards nearby, and even to family members of the emperor. Talk about someone whose trials redounded to the, the benefit of others. Others turning to Jesus Christ, the brethren waxing bold and seeing his faith increase their faith to live for Jesus Christ. And you and I, 2,000 years later, reading it, still being moved by the Holy Spirit when we read those words. Thank God for that. But some form of suffering should serve to make you more evangelistic. The most important consideration is not you. It's the spiritual needs of others. This life is temporary. And the trials of a, let's say, a sickness or a, a disease, some illness, some bad medical diagnosis, some form of pain and suffering, some form of discomfort, those trials should serve to remind you that this life is temporary. And when you're confronted with the prospect of maybe death, you're starting thinking, well, what do I need to do before that time comes? What do I need to get caught up on? And as a Christian, you say, if I haven't been witnessing like I should, I need to increase my efforts to witness for Jesus Christ. Do it while the time is here. You might, not, you, you might run out of chances. You might run out of opportunities. Last night, as I left my job, I detoured down to a place, coffee bean. I'll give them free advertisement. Buy a bag of coffee, get it ground up, take it home, and make it at home. Like I say, I deserve the best, right? I mean, I don't, I don't buy it in the can. And, MJB in Folgers. I don't get that. I was standing in line waiting to order, and there was a, a Chinese woman, and I had seen her in there maybe two weeks ago, and she kind of acted a little bit disoriented and had her head, hand to her head. And I just decided, you know, she, she might be in need. I said, excuse me, um, are you okay? First words out of her mouth. Are you a preacher? I said, well, yes, I am, but I, I thought maybe you need some help. So well, I got voices in my head talking back and forth, positive voices, negative voices, and I can't get it to stop. So I ordered, and she ordered, and she sat down in the booth, and I said, listen, is it okay if I sit down with you for a few minutes? And she let me. And the charismatics have poisoned her. She asked, I, I told her about our church, and I told her what, where we are. And she said, do you speak in tongues? And I said, no, no. We, we don't believe in that. We believe in, for example, we believe in healing, but we don't believe in these TV healers. We think they're charlatans. And when it comes to speaking with other tongues, if I don't know what I'm saying, I might think I'm praising God, but I may not be. I may be cursing God in some language I don't understand. 
And the devil comes along and he deceives me, makes me think I'm doing something right when I'm actually doing something wrong. And it's like suddenly a light came on in her mind that maybe that's where she went astray. We sat down at the table and she began to quote scripture to me. She had been memorizing a lot of scripture. And I prayed with her right there at the booth and then she started crying, her eye, tears coming down her face on the other side of the table that she was afraid she'd never be able to learn the Bible or memorize any scripture anymore because she'd been having these problems. And I, like I say, I prayed for her that God would give her peace of mind. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what every Christian ought to have. And if you go to some church and their doctrines uh, corrupt your thinking and give you an unstable mind, that's the wrong church. Get out of it. But last year, I've told you I, I go to some Buddhist temples and look around and observe, and I try to learn by exposure what they actually do and teach and, and believe in, because I'm working on a book uh, dealing with that subject. And I went to a Thailand uh, or Thai temple down in Chino Hills. I, a strange place. It used to be a Southern Baptist church. Now it's a Thai Buddhist temple. And I was walking around there one Saturday afternoon after work. And uh, they have a, an area of about 20 picnic tables and a big covered uh, tent area covering it. And they have lunch for all of their members every week. You know, like we do, we have lunch after church. A nice kitchen set up. I was jealous of their kitchen set up too, by the way. And there's a man working there preparing things. He was in charge of doing all the cooking every Sunday when, they, when all their people go there. And I said, I'm just looking around trying to learn more about the Buddhist beliefs. And I told him, I'm a Christian pastor, actually. But, uh, you know, I, I think it pays to look around and inquire firsthand. And he began telling me about his wife. She was sick. And um, the Buddhist monks, he asked them to pray for his wife. He said, they couldn't help her. Nothing happened. His tears coming down his face. I just met the man. He's crying on me. And so let me, let me pray for you. Let's ask God to get involved. So I shook his hand, and we prayed right there on the grounds. I didn't have any tracks in, in, the, Thailand, in the Thai language. I went to Chick Publications, bought a couple packs of tracks in Thai. Um, and then the next week, I went back, trying to find him again. And he was there working in the kitchen area. And I said, uh, Mr. Yuk, uh, I wanted to come and give you something to read. You know, with those language differences, there's really sometimes only so much you can do. You give him some tracks and pray that God blesses it. But I said, so how's your wife? She's fine. She's sitting right there. <laughs> She had gotten better in that week. And you, you plant seed, you water the seed, and once in a while, the seed's ready to spring forth in a new life. You happen to be there. But don't think that soul winning is getting from zero to 60 in 10 minutes. A lot of things go into cultivating that soul and making it ready to receive the gospel of Christ. He asked where our church was, and I gave him our church address and tracks. But, um, you know, it's hard to break someone from the culture that they're a part of. And maybe I'll go back and see him again. Maybe someday he'll come visit us. But this lady last night, she was interested in our, our um, church service. I said, listen, there's about a thousand videos of me on YouTube. Suddenly that she got interested in that. I don't know why. So I figured she'd probably go home and check out our, our website and check out some of my sermons. Maybe she'll come visit us too. But I've noticed in my own self, the last couple of years, I seem to be more mindful, more conscious of people's needs, their spiritual needs. Maybe I don't not every soul winner sees that person say yes to Jesus Christ all the time. Soul winning is a team effort. You do part, I'll do my part, God will take care of the rest. 
But I told this lady last night, the Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Sin isn't just doing something bad. Sin is failing to do what's good, what's right, when you can do it, when you have the opportunity to do it. And I said, it's only on that basis that I, I saw you might need, need some help, and I asked. And, and God stepped in and directed the rest of the conversation. But for the Christian, suffering should make him or her more evangelistic. Let me move on quickly here. Suffering causes you to pray more. That's point number 14. It causes you to pray more. You don't need to turn for time's sake. Let me read a few verses to you. Psalm 18, verses 3 through 6. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about, and the snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice and out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Not only should suffering cause you to pray more, but when you do, it, it helps to reassure you that God is listening. Don't you want to know that God's listening when you pray, when you talk to him? If you don't spend any time in prayer as a Christian... Maybe you need a little suffering. Maybe you need a little misery. Maybe you need a little bit of pain. So you become less dependent upon your own strength and your own health and your own ability and talents and more dependent upon God, more quick to call upon God. Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Times of grief, times of pain, times of anguish, times of disappointment and heartbreak, times of people deceiving you, times of great loss and death should drive you closer to God in prayer than you ever were before. Let me get to the end here. Benefit number 15, or possible benefit number 15, suffering purifies your faith. Suffering purifies your faith. You decide that God actually knows what he's doing after all. Job said in the midst of all of his afflictions, but he, God, knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job 23 verse 10. I mentioned Back at point number nine, suffering reminds you that this isn't heaven yet. It certainly isn't. You haven't been raptured yet. Your body hasn't been made glorified yet. You haven't seen Christ face to face yet. But you're hoping to very soon. Very soon. Every day you live, you're one day closer to the rapture of the saints. Think about it that way. I figured I'd shout at least once during this sermon. You're one day closer to the coming again of Jesus. You're one day closer to being glorified and made like him. The Apostle John wrote 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Your hope of heaven ought to purify your faith in God, your confidence in God, and everything that he promises to the saints. Now let me, before we finish this, let me quickly review the list that we've made over the last three weeks, you'll probably notice that they're all connected with each other in some way. Let's run through it here. Through suffering, number one, you win a victory in the unseen world. Benefit number two, suffering expands your view of God. You realize how insignificant you are. Number three, it keeps you humble. That was Paul's lesson. Number four, suffering brings closer fellowship with Jesus Christ, that I may know him 
Paul prayed. Point number five, suffering prepares you for greater blessings later on. You were elevated, get elevated just like Joseph was in Egypt. Point number six, suffering prepares you to see God's miracles take place. They may not take place, but they may. You want to be ready for it. Point number seven, suffering increases the testimony of God. That is, the knowledge of God is spread abroad. It causes you, and it's like I said, related to the, one of the last points, to care more about the needs of other people, spiritually. Point number uh, eight, suffering causes you to grow as a believer. Benefit number nine, it reminds you that this isn't heaven yet. We just mentioned that. Benefit number 10, suffering reveals the true body of Jesus Christ in the world. Benefit number 11, it gives each of us a ministry that we never imagined prior to that. Benefit number 12, suffering forces you to trust God more than you trust yourself. That was D.L. Moody's experience. Benefit 13, suffering makes you more evangelistic. That's related to the increase of the word of God, the, the knowledge of God. And point number 15 or 14, suffering causes you to pray more. The Bible says pray without ceasing. And benefit number 15, suffering uh, causes your faith to be purified. I, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that these have been helpful. And it's been helpful to me just working on it and praying about it. Let's look to God as we conclude today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this kind, your kindness toward us. We thank you for the things that can be taught to the saints if they would simply look for God's interests in the midst of their problems rather than concerned about their own. And no matter what trials we may go through, there's always someone whose problems are worse. So we thank you for the problems we don't have. Help us to put all that in perspective and to be grateful for what we have and and to trust you from day to day. And we'll ask all this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, we'll stop right there. Take a little break before Sunday school.